name of the triune God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So today is Holy Trinity Sunday. And, it, you know, it's not the most popular festival among preachers who, for all other reasons, special days of the church year, we normally get to dig into interesting gospel narratives. Most other festivals of the church celebrate a specific event. You know, we commemorate happenings in the life of Christ, Mary's visit from Gabriel announcing the miraculous child that she was to bear in the world, God's own word made flesh. We celebrate also the light-bearing nature of the season of Epiphany. We celebrate the messy baptism of our Lord, the confusing transfiguration, and Jesus riding triumphant into Jerusalem amidst the palms and the cheers. We celebrate the empty tomb of Easter, the glorious ascension, the chaotic coming of God's Spirit to the church at Pentecost that we celebrated last Sunday, amid all the red, all leading up to today's Holy Trinity Sunday, where we celebrate a church doctrine. Many preachers dread this day because they see it as a kind of dry, dusty theological topic after such the exciting and earthy part of the liturgy that has come before it. It's like there's this raucous party at Easter and Pentecost that comes to a screeching halt while an old crotchety minister, not, not me, shuffles up to the pulpit, blows the dust off an enormous leather-bound book, clears his throat and says, and now we celebrate a doctrine. <laughs> Lucky for you, the clergy at St. Augustine doesn't feel this way. For the last two Sundays, Reverend Jim and Reverend Thomas, they have teed up this most exciting and important Sunday. Reverend Thomas gave us a dramatic demonstration of the oneness in God using the Russian nesting dolls who bore the faces of the Beatles as he talked about love and the indwelling of God in us and we in him. And then Reverend Jim, who spoke last week on God's sending the Holy Spirit, the great advocate, the breath of God, to swirl around us, to bring comfort and to continue us feeling the presence of God. And then this morning, well, I consider myself to be the closer, <laughs> the one who brings all of this to a grand conclusion. So let's get right down to it, shall we? Okay, so here we go. God is three persons and one being. God is one and yet three. The Father is not the Son or the Spirit. The Son is not the Father or the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father or the Son. But the Father, Son, and Spirit are one God, and God is one. And so, reviewing that, we have one plus one plus one that equals one. Very simple, right? So it's no wonder that so many of the early church councils were called to try to make sense of this Trinitarian formula. The church took its time coming up with the doctrine of the Trinity, and there was a lot of ink and a lot of blood spilled over the matter. So there are many printed formulas and symbols to help define and explain the concept, many of which are considered heretical. But I chose one, and I stuck a copy of it in your bulletin. I chose a 14th century Russian Orthodox icon by Andrei Rublev that I've inserted. This is a beautiful, artistic depiction of the welcome that we have, the welcoming that we have into the life of the Trinity. So I encourage you to look at that icon, and what you'll see is an image inspired by the Abraham story of three visitors of God whom Abraham welcomed. Now, some have suggested that all three of these men were angelic beings who appeared to Abraham in the form of men. However, in Genesis chapter 18, verse 1, it says that it was the Lord, or Yahweh, who appeared to Abraham. Rublev depicts those three figures in the icon as angels who are seated at an altar table. And you'll notice that they all have identical faces, but it's their posture and their clothing that differs. And so we're looking at the same figure shown in three different ways. But it is the way in, each, in which each of these figures relate to one another so that is so compelling to me. The father looks to the son gesturing towards the word made flesh. Christ gazes back at the Father, but he points to the Spirit. And the Spirit opens up the circle 
to receive the viewer of the icon, to receive us. Between the Spirit and the Father and the Trinity icon, there's an open space at the table in which we are brought to sit in communion with the Godhead. Here we see an image of God's relational circle into which we are welcomed. The Father sends the Son, the Son sends the Spirit, and the Spirit is what welcomes us to the table. It is a lush image of how God relates to God's self and how God relates to us, making a place for it, us at his table. Now there are references to the Trinity throughout Scripture that we may have missed, the first being in the second sentence of the book of Genesis, chapter 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was over the face of the deep. And then the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was hovering over the face of the water. And then again in verse 26, when God creates man, God's words are written using the plural. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. But I think just as important, if not more so, is experiencing the Trinity, God, in our daily lives. In the Trinitarian nature of God, individuality and communality are related in this beautiful life-giving dance of creation. Whatever names we choose to use, whether it's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or Holy Parent, Holy Child, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, and Advocate, the three aspects remain distinct, while the identity remains one through mutual nature of giving and receiving, back and forth together throughout time. And maybe this is not some dusty old doctrine after all, but is about a God who pours out God's own communal self into all of creation. Ours is a God who is revealed in the word and in the meal that is shared among the beloved community throughout the ages and in all places. This triune God made known through scripture and the prophets, through the gospel and the cross, through the baptismal font and the Eucharistic table. This God is the one who welcomes us into this sacred life of mission that is commanded by God or by Christ in the gospel. So perhaps it would be much easier for everyone if we had a God who was just a little bit easier to peg down. And I was thinking about this in our morning discussion in Adult Forum, and if you guys are not coming to Adult Forum, you're missing some really good discussions. I wish we had a God that was easier to peg down, but you know, Luckily, that's not the case. And while, like the prophets and the theologians of past and present, struggle to explain this Godhead, you know, we don't have to. We just believe. And we experience the love and the saving grace of God that comes to us in whatever form we need at whatever time we need it. Now, I've experienced God many times, as I know most all of you have. Sometimes I knew it at the exact moment it happened. Other times it's taken me years to look back on an event to see God's hand in it. But let me tell you about two visceral experiences I had with God through the Holy Spirit that really stand out to me to this very day. The first one happened at our annual convention about 15 years ago. I think we were at Jekyll Island, and I was newly ordained as a deacon at the time, serving in Waynesboro. And the deacons had decided to gather during our lunch break so that we could pray for and over each other. And specifically, we wanted to come together to pray over one of our deacons was about, who was about to have a procedure that was tied to cancer. We wanted to lay hands upon her and have a prayer. And so she sat in a chair, in the middle of that room, we were in one of those small rooms off the main gathering, and there were about 20, maybe 25 of us laying hands on her, and if we couldn't touch her, we laid hands on one of the other deacons. We created this huddled mass of collared clergy. And the deacon who led the prayer was a member of the Order of St. John. It was an order that promotes physical, mental, and spiritual healing and resilience. He began the prayer by saying over and over in this most eloquent way, Come, 
Holy Spirit, come. Now, mind you, it was lunchtime, <laughs> and I was hungry, and so I became a bit impatient. It's like, hurry up, let's get on with it, let's move on, let's have the prayer. I don't want to wait and just have the pickings left over from everyone else. But he kept saying, come, Holy Spirit. And it wasn't that long after he started to pray that I felt every hair on my body stand up, stood on end, even the hair on my head that was pricked with the energy of some unseen power in that room. And as he finished the prayer, we all left in silence. And I pulled my friend Becky, who's now a priest also, I pulled her aside and I said, did you feel that? She said, I did, giving me that knowing look that she too had felt the power of that prayer and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then the same thing happened years later when I was at Swanee, this time studying to be a priest. And we always had chapel right before lunch. I think the Holy Spirit moves the most at lunchtime, seems like. And different folks, sometimes students, sometimes faculty, were tapped to give a short homily. And on that particular afternoon, it was a faculty member. And when she began to speak about the death of her mother, she was using that, as, uh, that event as an example of some point that she was making. I once again experienced the tingling of the power of the presence of God. And after I found myself standing in line behind her in the cafeteria, and she was telling the woman next to her, gosh, did you feel that? I felt something in that chapel. I think, I think it was the Holy Spirit. And I just had to smile, and I tapped her on the shoulder, and I said, I felt it too. Now, I don't know how God touches you, or I don't know how God speaks to you, or how you sense the Holy Spirit when she calls upon you, but there's no doubt there is a love and a power that is so overwhelming, so encompassing in this universe that it cannot be contained. And the good news is that we are all a part of this relational dance with God in which we're invited to live into the fullness of our identity as beloved children of God. And as it is reflected in our icon, I want you to look at that again and realize that there is room being made for us all at the table to sit in God's presence. There's room for us all. You know, I was thinking last night and this morning and every day, this place is a most holy space, and it is filled with physical items which are outward signs of our walk with God. We all came in this morning passing the baptismal font, which is placed right there, so we Remember our baptismal vows. And of course, we have Christ on the cross overhead to remind us of our victory over death through his victory over death. And then in a few minutes, we will again celebrate the elements of bread and wine of communion in which we believe Jesus' physical body and blood is present. Signs of the Trinitarian God that are referenced in our readings today. We heard about and read about the Holy Spirit or wisdom from Proverbs and Jesus Christ who gives us access to God's grace in our reading from Romans and the God who sends the spirit of truth so that we can continue to have faith as it's stated in our reading from the Gospel of John. And so my prayer for all of us is that we continue to feel the tingle and to hear the whisper and to feel the breath of God every day of our lives as we find our way back to him. Amen. Amen.